Oh, look at that. Isn't that the coolest thing that you've ever seen? <laughs> well, that's the certainly... first time I've seen that, Simon. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's a cracker, isn't it? And I hope that uh, there's a few people here giving us a chuckle as well and enjoy, <laughs> enjoying the visuals that we've come up with there to, to kick us on um, on such a night. So give us a bit of a thumbs up in the, in the chat comments or with your, with your emoticon things if you, if you reckon that was a kicker of a start. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Prashant, for uh, kicking us off and just introducing us tonight. Um, and welcome to absolutely, thanks Axel, welcome to everybody that uh, has joined us here. Um, welcome to our, I don't know if I'll call it the first High Buddies show, this is sort of our second iteration, Ryan, but um, this is a place where some mates are sort of gathering together to talk about all things bees. Um, and in doing that, we're going to have our special uh, guest each time to come along and help with the conversation and give us some perspective. Um, and we'll talk about more on that um, shortly, but um, over to you, mate. Do you want to, I'll, I'll let you say good day. <laughs> yeah, that was, um, that was one heck of an opening. I, I know you sent it through, but I, when you sent it through, I didn't have the, um, I didn't have the audio for some reason. That was, <laughs> that, was go with it. that was something else. But yeah, like, you know, like you said, this is, uh, this is the second show. We're just going to kind of keep throwing things in uh, as you go. I mean, like, look, look at our beautiful background. This is um, looking sharp. Yeah, Simon uh, organised this from uh, Fiverr, which is fantastic. I'm loving it, and uh, also loving the little, the little. Let's go this way. The blue banded bee. Yeah, I love that. So, <laughs> can I say what's bizarre about that is the person that I got some help with to uh, like. I'm not this uh, clever graphic designer. The person who did that wouldn't have a clue about like what bee to choose. How did they figure that out? I've got no idea to choose a blue banded bee. So, well done to them. <laughs> that's nice i mean they're not going to live in the hives behind us but hey who cares <laughs> precisely <laughs> well you know like uh, as you said you know we're here we're going to be doing this show um and we're going to have a, uh, a special guest um who's going to be our expert because you know simon and i you know we love bees but we um we i don't know i wouldn't call us experts when you call us experts nah, nah. Oh, we're, we're having, a go, having a go <laughs> we are having a go we haven't we, we know a few things but uh there's there are people who know more so we uh we're gonna have a, uh, a guest who's going to join us each week and this week we have michael johnson from the basin backyard now let me just let me just give you a little quick rundown of Michael, all right? So Michael started beekeeping 10 years ago with one hive just for his backyard for, um, for some pollination, right? And then he grew it out over, the, over seven years. He grew it out to 40 hives. And now he's been a commercial beekeeper. He took over uh, the Bunyip Beekeeper. So he actually had an engineering business, which he sold. And on the day that that settled, he was out for a walk. And there was a swarm of bees that he saw with him and his wife. And the Bunyan beekeeper went into, was, in, was liquidated uh, and was, was um, advertised. And he's just applied for it and they've sold it to him. And so he's, he's gone overnight from just being, you know, well, you know, a hobbyist in a way, yep. for 40 hives yep. to overnight to commercial beekeeper, 200 hives plus a shop plus everything else that goes with it. And he's an absolutely amazing man who's got some incredible ideas. So we're very, very lucky to have Michael Johnson from the Basin Backyard. Michael, are you there? Stick your camera on, mate, and your microphone. I am. I'm not sure that I'm the expert that you were hoping for, though, but let's give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've got opinions. Don't you worry about that. Oh, yeah, stuff. I've got plenty of them. <laughs> oh, look, opinions and different ideas is what this is all about, is bringing a whole heap of different thoughts and ideas to the table. And Michael, it's an absolute cracker to have you uh, be part of this and part of the Hype Buddy mentorship team, and maybe more on that later. Yeah, but, thanks, um, guys. Yeah, really uh, privileged to be able to have you here. Thank you. No, thank you, guys, for inviting me. No, absolutely <laughs> awesome. Well, our little uh, traditional thing is to sort of kick something off with sort of what sparked our interest um, in the last week uh, or so. Ryan? Has anything sparked your interest uh, in recent times? It has, yeah. I don't know. We, we should call this, uh, you know, Ryan's revelation for the week, perhaps. Uh, there was a there was a couple of um, it was, it was probably a couple of weeks ago, or no, a week ago or so ago. I, I posted a uh, a thing on Facebook about um about heating honey and the oh. treatment of honey um <laughs> and the ultrafiltration of honey, right? And I copped a I copped a bit of backlash for it. Uh, for my opinion, which is absolutely fine. It's it's um it's fine. But 
part of it was I, I you know, so, someone who, who kind of was giving me a little bit of grief. I was like, okay, great. No problems. Teach me, tell me, tell me why, give me something to read, give me something to learn so that I can go away. I can inform, you know, more of an opinion, which is, which is fantastic. And that's one of the things that, you know, that that's probably special about the hive buddy platform and the hive buddy show is that we're actually trying to take the ego out of it. Um, and we want to have a place where we kind of go, Hey, this is my opinion, but you know what? I went and learned something else. And, you know, perhaps I was wrong or perhaps I learned, you know, I, I've, I've learned something else. So what I want to get to though, is like saying about um, the heat treatment and uh, ultra filtration of, of honey. And I know a lot of uh, backyarders or small operators and whatnot pride themselves on, on not on selling raw honey, uh, not heating it above uh, 40 degrees, uh, not doing ultra filtration. So it's still got bits of pollen, still got um, bits of wax in it perhaps. Um, uh, but basically it's all, it's all the kind of really good stuff. And it's that good stuff that's actually really, really good for you um, mm, sure. as, as a person. Um, and when you actually heat that stuff up above 45, 50, 60 degrees, um, that all of those kind of proteins are actually killed off. Um, but the thing about that is, is that if you're, we want honey to be in our shops, right? We want honey to be in supermarkets because even, you know, like as, as you know, small operators, we want people to be aware of honey, right? Um, and if I'm going to sell to a supermarket, I need to be able to sell in what's called IBCs. So massive, massive things, you know, I need to be able to sell them and, and you know, kind of um, supply a, a large amount of honey. And if I'm going to do that, I actually need to make sure that that honey doesn't ferment in any particular way. So there are particular prices and there's also the supermarkets require particular health certificates in order for you to actually supply to them, right? Part of that health certificate is that it's got to go through these actual heat processes. Heat processes. It's got to go through these ultra filtration processes in order to actually get it there. Um, so kind of what I'm getting to is that my opinion was kind of like, oh, you know, raw is best and all this kind of stuff. And then there's this, the supermarket stuff. But what I actually want to say is that they're two different products and they serve completely different markets. And I was probably too harsh on those supermarket guys because that, you know, like they've got, they've got to, they've got to do all the pollination. Like us as a, I'm not going to be able to supply thousands and thousands of hives in order to do pollination. Right. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, um, so those guys that do, they're going to have thousands and thousands of tons of honey and they've got to do something with it. Right. So, you know, it's a different, it's a different kind of product. And the truth um, of the matter is, too, is that there's so many different consumers looking for so many different products. And there are people out there so excited about the opportunity to buy local. And I think most people actually would like to buy local. I think that's uh, generally how it works. But in many instances, people are, are very price conscious. We know that. And we can't like uh, we can't like blame people uh, to be like that. That just makes a lot of sense. So we need to be able to look at things in many different ways and not just... Uh, think that there's only one way that this can happen and i think that's what um sounds like it's worked out for you this this last week or so yeah yeah it's been been a really really interesting really really interesting um uh kind of uh delve into it which is quite nice and it's also kind of also given me a bit more confidence a bit more knowledge mm. in my product um and you know kind of to completely understand the differences between it which also helps with the marketing of it as well. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, sure. So yeah, it's kind of it kind of works on that. Um, Michael, have you got any, any opinions on that kind of aspect? Yeah. Look, the only thing I'd say that the, if if COVID have has to have a good side of it, the good side of COVID is people are now at home starting to finally think about what they eat, and that that's running right through the food chain, and and honey just becoming part of that. And so obviously, you know, I do a lot of farmers markets and the people that are coming to the farmers markets, they're happy to, there's no questions asked. They don't even ask how much is a jar of honey. They pick the jar of honey up, you put it through the cart, it, it's gone. But because they've done all the the, um, the checking, they've done all the, in, the work behind of what's going on. And there was a really good article about uh, two, three weeks ago about how honey needs to come out of the pantry and into the medicine cabinet. And it is like that. It is really like that. I mean, at the moment, I'm taking a teaspoon of Jarrah honey every day. If, if you knew the medicinal properties of Jarrah honey, Manuka's dead. 
Like seriously, Manuka has, has it, it's gone. Kiss it goodbye. If Jarra is able to be supplied in the amounts that Manuka honey is supplied in, but that's the problem. It's it can't be. So you know, it, it's med- medicinal wise, it, it it can't be beaten. It really can't be beaten. Yeah. And can I throw one out there? And this will be music to the ears of Prashant because uh, something that we've been working on is the whole idea of medicinal honey that isn't sourced in Australia. Now, I know that puts people up in arms about the idea of we must be sourcing locally. And yeah, like I generally fundamentally do agree with that. But um, one really important part is that sometimes there are offerings that we just simply can't get from here. And something that Prashant is researching for, for us is Indian medicinal honey from high up in the Himalayan mountains and what is actually available and can be found there. Now, more on that in the future. Like we're at our like infancy in trying to comprehend and understand that. But the value that's coming uh, out of other countries is, is absolutely worthy of, uh, of, of consideration. And I'm excited, uh, Michael, to learn more about what you're, what you're talking about there at some point too. Yeah, so, so one of the medicinal properties in honey is PA or, or peroxide. And because we're water, when we consume peroxide um, intense honeys, we convert it into hydrogen peroxide. And it's just one of the best things that you can stick into your gut. I mean, Ryan's probably a little bit younger than I am, but back in the day, you know, I used to blonde my hair with peroxide, hydrogen peroxide to be, you know, to be the blondie. But, Is that but what now, happened? You know, yeah, yeah. Look, look now, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know, peroxide is just, and that's the thing with manuka. Manuka does not have peroxide in it. So yeah. you know, this hydrogen peroxide conversion into our gut, and and the other, you know, the jar has been scientifically proven to survive the stomach acids and actually enter the uh, small intestine, where where manuka doesn't. The, the stomach acid kills it off. Does so, Manuka have different things that Jarrah doesn't? Uh, no. No, Manuka has, Jarrah has more than what Manuka does. Right. So, so, like so, and all so, that kind of stuff. so at the moment, um, Jarrah's um, measured in what's called TA or total activity. And that's the total, total activity of the microbioorganisms bio that's going on in the honey. Manuka's MGO. So a TA35 Jarrah honey that's coming out of uh, Western Australia is equivalent to a MGO 2000 Manuka. Oh, wow. oh my Lord. Wow. Now, now an MGO 2000 Manuka is about 250 bucks mm-hmm. for a two, for a 20, 250 gram jar. Yeah. A, a Sorry, TA yeah, 30, five, yeah. 500 yeah. bucks for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, TA, a TA 35 Jarrah honey is, is, sell, is um, $50 for 500 grams. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's too cheap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I'm saying. Kiss Maruka goodbye. It's interesting what you say about the stomach acid thing. And I know that um, some a lot of people um, from the Maruka industry would say, whoa, what are people doing eating the damn stuff? Yes. Not for eating. And yeah. it's for like applying yeah. topically and you put it on things and, and, and like there's the value that come, that is derived from that. So that, may, that maybe is an interesting point just to think about too in that um, – Lots of people think honey, medicinal honey is all about what you consume. But in many instances, like I think that uh, many communities don't buy it to, to put in their mouth it's, or put in their cup of tea or to put on their porridge. It's putting it on the injury or the on the skin or somewhere where you want that improvement. So like, it, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if I, get, if I get people come in and they want Manuka, that's exactly what I ask them for. What do you want the Manuka for? And they say for gut yeah. health. And I say, see that, see that mixed blossom there on the mm-hmm. shelf? That's got far more benefit for you internally than Manuka will ever, ever have. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, Simon. Hello. Now, you've, you've, uh, we've talked about what, uh, what's caught my eye this week. Now, you, you shared something pretty absolutely fascinating with me. Um, <laughs> and I think you need to tell, you know, I think you need to share it with our hive buddies here. Uh, what, what's caught your eye? Is, so is I need to share Thank you. I've got to share the screen. So let me just press a button or two. And I've just also in the chat uh, notes, I've uh, just put the website that I'm sharing so uh, people can have a look. So, Ryan, this is the ancient art of figure booty. (laughs) 
<laughs> what is that? Oh, the ancient art of figure booty. And um, this is a German website, so uh, it might not all make perfect, complete sense when you're... When, when is it G-rated? If it's figure booty, it's German rate? No, sorry. No. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's okay. No, I'm not sure if, it's, if we're at the G level, but let's have a look. So I've brought you straight to the website. I just want to scroll down and like show you a little bit about what this is. The other name for figure booty is AP Sculpture. Apis being bees, sculpture, bee sculptures. And it's anyone who actually knows me would think, oh, um, this is like odd for Simon to want to talk about. But hey, we're on a program with lots of like different ideas and thoughts. And this one is totally foreign and strange to me. Um, that's why that's come about. So the whole idea of it is sculpting a place for bees to live and making something like beautiful or majestic or amazing out of it. Um, and like, there's a classic example is like, you've got to start somewhere with this and you start with a gigantic lump of timber and you're essentially and going- a gigantic to... chainsaw, that is that's impressive. A, that's a cracker, isn't it? At the end of this is you've created some sort of sculpture which bees live on the inside. And it go. I won't show you that video there, but as we go down, you'll start to sort of um, see what's going on here. And there's whole- <laughs> um, Banana. Yes, yes, it's a it's banana, a banana. Michael. <laughs> Michael, you need one of these out in the front of your shop, mate. So I do, one, yeah. The one thing I do, I, I hope that might happen from us going through this right now, is that a few people go, I'm going to, this has inspired me to think about what figure booty I might uh, bring into this world. But as you can see, and I think my, my, my um, cursor is showing on your screen there, but you can see that there is still the ability to get in there and have a look, and then there are re removable frames like normal. But... These sculptures exist in many different forms and they're found in parks, really specific parks and reserves um, over in Germany and other European nations. And there's this huge thing that it's been around for a very long time, but now there's this like desire to um, um, bring them back and make them more of a thing and preserve them and bring, and bring them and restore them and bring them back to life. And you go, what is going on here? Well, that just central central to the lovely uh, buxom lady, there is an opening there for the bees to come and go from. And I just find this whole thing, well, completely absurd in a way. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's beautiful. But, Look at it. But like, it's so amazing. Like, pretty full on at the same time. Like, not my sort of sculpture, but it makes me think what would be my type of sculpture. And if I, like, had the skills and the time and the desire where would I take this? And this website, which, as I said, is, I've posted in the comments, is just, there's just so many examples. And if you go and look at this and do a bit more Google. Out of the baby. Out of yeah. the baby's yeah. mouth. What's the deal? Jesus. <laughs> Maybe, is that baby cheeses? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not um, qualified <laughs> to say it, I don't think. But there's just some random stuff going on. Anyway, this is what's caught my eye lately. And if you do Google it, there's a little bit more going on. There's a couple of just key places that where this exists. But I'd like to, I'm not saying I'm about to start it, but I'm hoping we can bring back the, uh, bring, maybe, maybe it's never was here, but bring the figure booty industry here to, <laughs> here to Australia. So I want some hands up from tonight. I want some people to go, yeah, that, that, that's where I'm heading. That's what I'm going to do. Um, it's, it's taking the idea of a log hive to the extreme, isn't it? Oh my gosh! Anyway, I could. It, there's a, I've still got a bit to scroll, but as you can see, it's just out there and wild. I hope like that's that like inspired, if not frightened, some people. Um, Thank you. Thank you future. so much for sharing that. That's I'm up for a challenge. <laughs> oh, Michael. All right. Okay. Interesting. The brain is now in gear. <laughs> and I hope I hope the same for some others because it's it is wild. That is a, it's a wild concept, but I reckon it's absolutely worthy of uh, a little bit of thinking about. Crazy. Can I just answer, sorry, I'll answer one quick question popped up on the screen? Can we yeah. eat too much honey? And, and the answer is yes and no. So honey potentially has botulinum spores. The cold filtered honey potentially has botulinum spores. Yes. So if you have a, a, immune compromised, a, a compromised immune system, 100% you can eat too much honey. But, uh, you know, any, any other way, there's not a problem. So, so technically, children, well, could you, you could you inject it into your face if you really want to? Um, I'll come <laughs> down to your place and we'll try that, Ryan, and we'll explain that oh, in two know, weeks. We'll explain minute, in yeah. two weeks how that went. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hey, we've just had a request in um, um, to do a, bit, a Greek Spartan, a giant Greek Spartan full of bees. 
Jesus. Hello. A Trojan that- horse. <laughs> Trojan horse. There we go. I'm up. Oh, wow. Okay. Trojan horse. All right. Oh, okay. gosh. Hey, that's crazy. Well, look, um, I probably should uh, push on to our sort of topical theme of the, uh, the session. Yep. Um, and this is where I'm going to draw on Michael a whole lot here, but also, Ryan, what you've noticed lately. And this time we're going to talk about spring preparation. And I don't know about you guys, but today was my first little peek inside my hives just to do a like, quick analysis, a couple of minute analysis in the sun. But it's just around the corner and I feel like we're moments away from like being off our feet. So my question to you guys or my first thing to pose is like, what do people need to be thinking about right now given it's mid-august in the southern hemisphere we're, we're coming out of um, winter going in about to hit spring what are some thoughts that you guys have had based off what you're seeing at the moment and what, what's happening for you right at this very point that there's people have got two choices to to make am i going to give my bees more room or am i going to split the hive that's the most important thing that people need to understand right now now in simple terms for people that aren't experiencing, by splitting the hive, you're basically creating the swarm yourself. You're doing the swarm for the bees. So let's just work out, okay, am I going to manually swarm the hive or am I going to give them more room to stop them from swarming? So that's that's what you need to know now. Have I got enough equipment to build extra boxes, put more frames in or <laughs> split the hive and put them into, a, in, into another hive, basically, what they should be thinking about right now. And along with that, from a timing perspective, I'm going to play the guy who doesn't like who's brand new at all of this. Um, It's still pretty cold around here. Um, Like it's lucky to get to 16, 17 degrees. Um, Spring's probably going to be a bit cool. I don't don't feel like I need to rush this yet. What's your sort of response to that, Michael? Because I've still got another month of cold weather. Yeah, I'm totally frustrated at the moment. But whilst we're locked down, it's good that I can't open my shop, but I want to be in my car under supering it as much as I can at the moment. But it, it's just pointless doing it right at this very moment. So, yeah, until we start getting... This is a, a thing that an, annoys me in the in the bee industry and people and some people don't see the side of it. But, yes, it's 19 degrees. Today's a perfect example. If it's been 18 degrees in Melbourne, a lot of people have probably gone out and opened up their hives. Tomorrow, it's 13. There's an environment inside that hive that once you start pulling it apart, it cre- it takes days, not just hours, but days to get that environment back into the hive. So opening a hive today, pulling a hive apart today at 18 degrees to have 13 tomorrow, it's just not on. So you've got to wait and, see, and, and look further for, forward that I've got three or four days of 17, 18, 19, now I can start pulling my hive apart. That's that's what you really, really need to get through your head. So really Thanks. being careful of that interruption to the internal little micro um, climate yes. system that's occurring there. Yes, yes. And as I say, a lot of un- inexperienced people would have been, they read, oh, you know, it needs to be 17, 18. They would have gone out today and opened their hives because that's what they're being misinformed on Facebook, on YouTube videos. <laughs> you know, And that's what I'm going to love about this hive buddies it's a place where you're not going to get 20,000 different answers. You know, you're going to get experienced people. You might not like the answer, but in, in a lot of the cases, it's going to be the right answer. Your choice whether to take it or not. And also, yeah. I suppose the idea comes from um, if you've got like quality people that have spent a long time around bees, like you and Ryan could have a, a different way of doing something. But the truth yes. is, is you've, you've had a lot of repetition You've been doing doing a lot of that, both of you, and therefore you might do things differently, yet you've both got answers that are relevant for the circumstances. And it's okay that there's different outcomes. It really can be okay from time to time. But the truth is you've got a lot of, both have got a lot of experience in trying that, for example. Yeah, 100%. And, 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 every, and every beekeeper does have different techniques and they work for them and that's fine. So long yeah. as it works for you and works most importantly for the bees, then keep doing it. Yep. But, you know, if it's not working for the bees, please change your habits. So, Michael, when you're talking about pulling apart the hive, are you talking about pulling out frames or just taking yes. the lid off? No, pulling out frames, actually inspecting, because once yeah. again, they're being told right at this point to pull, out, to pull out frames and look for queen cells. There's no queen cells there at the moment. There's not going to be queen cells until the end of September. As, as Simon's saying, with the weather at this moment, Yes, there's lots of pollen and nectar coming in, but they, they know at the moment that spring still is not here full on. 
They don't need to be building queen cells and, and everything. So, and you, you can know, look for queen cells from underneath as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> you don't need to yeah, pull the yeah, frames yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So your so point, I, Michael, is about breaking the cluster. And yes. keep if that's kept tight, and I know you're actually big, big on this, Ryan, maybe you're better at explaining that. Um, about like making having a look but but without having to do so breaking the cluster do you want to sort of explain a bit what you do ryan or what well it's uh, just basically copying copying um a beekeeper called michael palmer um who lives in a very very cold environment in canada um and uh, essentially it's the you know it's the cold weather inspection um and it's basically just taking the top off looking well first of all you're looking at sorry before you even take the top off you're, you're looking at the activity at the hive, um, at the entrance. You're seeing what they're doing if they're coming in with nectar or pollen. Um, and if, I mean, you can see the pollen on their legs. If they don't have pollen on their legs, then you're assuming that they're going to bring in nectar, um, unless it's that specific time of the day, which is, tends to be about three o'clock, where they're all doing orientation flights, um, which is a different thing altogether. But we're, we're looking at the activity, first of all. Um, and then I knock on the front, first of all, to actually see how long it takes for the bees to actually come out. Mm. Um, if, it's, if it takes them a little while, you know that they're actually up high yeah. in the hive um, and that they're really nice and tight, right? If you knock on it and they're pretty much there, like straight away or, you know, shortly afterwards, you know that they're around the entrance because it's a bigger cluster. You know that there's a population in there that's kind of larger in a way. Yep. Take the lid off. And the first thing I do is, is well, I'm looking for um, insects, first of all. I'm looking for small hive beetles. I'm looking for wax moths first. So I always look for disease first. Yep. Um, and then I'm counting scenes of bees. So how many, how many rows of the bees in between the frames? Um, and if I've got, you know, if it's, an eight, if it's an eight frame hive and I've got five, then I kind of go, oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's overwintered well. Um, if I've got seven, I go, you're going to be looking for some room. Um, all right, cool. Next thing I do is just pick the box up uh, as a whole. So don't pull out any frames. Um, oh, sorry, hang on. Before I do that, um, look for honey uh, in the top. And if I can't, like, can't see any, I get my hive tool and put it into the top and just see if there's actually honey in there. If there's any honey on the end of the tool, well, then they're in contact with honey. If there's no honey on the end of the tool, well, then perhaps they're starving. You yeah. know, maybe they've, maybe they've eaten it all. Um, and then you're looking at what are you going to do? You're going to feed them or something like that. Lift the box up. And as I look underneath, then I'm looking for brood on the, on the inside of the frames. Um, I'm looking for queen cells underneath. I'm looking for drone cells um, to see if they're starting to make drones yet. If they're starting to make drones, well, then they're going to be looking at breeding. Um, if they're doing queen cells, well, then they're going to be looking at swarming. Um, so drone cells are probably your biggest indicator as to what they're going to be doing, I think. Um, and then, you know, we're looking at population as well while we're in there. So all of that is you've pretty much got, you know, apart from checking for EFB and AFB, um, you've pretty much got everything covered without actually pulling every frame apart. So that's, that's probably those inspections there. No, no, that's fantastic. And then as you heard me say a word before, under supering, at that stage where yes. you've got the lid off and you've seen you've got seven full frames of bees, well, to give yourself a time, a, a bit of time, when you lift that box, put another box in between so that they all automatically you've bought yourself a month. You've so if you were talking a like a like a, a double hive, a double a double height hive. Yes. Um, you'd leave the bottom as brood, put in this second one, and then Correct. put the top one as whatever. Back on. Was. Yes. Yeah, back yeah. on. So force them yeah. to actually have to walk back up through that second box. All of a sudden they go, wow, we've got all this room all of a sudden. The, the colony starts to generate more and more of what's going on. And as I say, you've bought yourself a month of having to physically pull that hive completely apart to see what is actually going on. So that's, that's also, that also sounds like the De Marie method, right? Yes. Yeah. May yeah. I ask a question there? Because I'm sure someone else is thinking it as well. If I'm taking two boxes moving them apart and putting another box in between. Mm -hmm. What happens if there's brood running between my two original boxes? Are you suggesting I'm splitting that in half in this instance? I, I would say at this time of year, it'd be very, very unusual for two boxes to have brood in it, Simon. So, yeah. I'm not saying that, that it wouldn't be, that it wouldn't, but it'd be extremely unlikely 
that there would be two boxes of brood right at this point of time. And if they happen to be just because sometimes they do random things and they're spread across two boxes, would it be a good idea to leave the brood chamber intact then? Yes, most definitely. Yeah. So don't yeah. if, if yeah. by chance they are spread across two boxes, you better leave those together so that they can stay stay where they are. Is that that's yes. the general thinking? Yes. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I reckon others yeah. would think this would be curious about that same point. Good, yes. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and probably something that might even catch you out too is you might see that there's a whole lot of brood in this top box. And they go, oh, wow, yeah, look, they've, they've, they're starting to lay in this top box. Check the bottom box because there's yes. any chance that during winter they've actually just moved up. And if mm. they've just moved up, well, then you just swap the boxes around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what else have you been noticing uh, in your little site visits lately, Ryan? I know it's not as easy, but I know a lot of them are close to you, um, so you can get out and have a look. Is there anything that you're visually spotting about your sites and your and your eyes or your bees? You know, you know what? I know it's like you know we're coming back to you know what you're saying is what you should have done or you know what should you be doing? Yeah, know what you're going to say. For spring preparation, right? right? I'm going to take it back a step, and it's like what should I have already done? Boom. Yeah. <laughs> And what I should have already done is had my boxes made yeah, totally. <laughs> and had my foundation in my frames. And, Michael, I'm going to come and get some more off you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that stuff is, is – so I've actually I've – I've done a few inspections. Yep. But from those few inspections, I've gone, okay, they're going to pop in the next couple of weeks. And I actually need to have all these boxes ready to rock and roll. So I'm not even really going to bother with further inspections from this point on. Until I've got all my boxes ready, because as soon Makes as sense. as soon as they're ready to go, I'm just going to be taking them and putting them boxes yeah. straight in. Well, there's no there's no valid reason to interrupt them if you can't actually take any meaningful action because you haven't got them no. here ready. So otherwise, Correct. yeah, no. just leave them where they are. No. Hey, I noticed something and, interesting today um, on my, and you guys will probably have the answer for this. I've already noticed a European wasp at my hive. Same. Same. Wow. Now. Yeah. Am I seeing a queen European wasp? I don't think so. Because I, I thought I had my, like, yeah, it was a, it's a moderate size. My one was tiny. It was a moderate size one, one that I would consider would just be a standard normal foraging one in the uh, for the rest of that you'd see in the middle of summer. And I've seen it on two different days. And today I saw them there coming at the front of one hive and like trying to pick a fight. And it definitely did not give me the impression that there's that it was a queen. And it's making me think, are there Colonies already established this spring. I find that hard to believe, but I'm, really, not, yeah. I'm not. I'm not a waspologist. And the other thing is, is is it even possible? I don't know either. Can a wasp colony survive through winter in under mild conditions? Yeah, well, I'm no expert, but once again, if you look at the animal kingdom and, and even us as humans, we learn to adapt. And and I would say European wasps have been here for a minimum of ten years. I, I would say 100% they're learning to adapt with our conditions. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, I, I could be wrong, but that's potentially exactly what, what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah it, was, it was a surprise. From my understanding, I think what is the, the queen, at the end of the summer, the queens, the, the queen makes a whole bunch more queens, a whole bunch yes. of virgin yes. queens. Yeah. And those virgin queens then go off and find somewhere else. And yes. they overwinter on their own. Yeah, correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in then, your wood, in your wood pile. If you've got a wood yeah. pile, they're in your wood pile. Yeah. yeah. And then they and then they slowly build up. And the reason why it's a slow build up is because the wasps are actually really inefficient at feeding themselves. So they yes. actually, it's they've got to feed the larvae, and the larvae feed it back to the wasps, and then that's how they get fed. So I think that's why mm. it takes a while. And then by the end of summer, they're out of control because they've actually kind of gradually built, 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 built. And then they're looking to send the virgins off again. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, got, I, was, I was caught out by that. Shan't yeah. Shan't, what do you got? You you stuck your camera on. You're telling you're telling us that there's something happening. <laughs> yes. There are some questions. I just um uh, just focusing on them. Will has said that on the Mornington Peninsula, putting an extra extra super box is now okay. Guys? Is now okay. Yeah. Um, well, actually, you know what, Michael? You were down here the other day, popping into the beach hut. Were you putting any mm. any supers on, or would you put any supers on in Mornington around? There? No, I, I went down to check. This was in Red Hill region, and yeah, there, there's just no way. With as I say, the cold days that are coming once again next week, it, it's the wrong time to be putting another super box on. One hundred percent, the wrong. 
Yep. Yep. Just just be patient, David. It's coming, but just be patient. So maybe if we're looking at making more room, instead of looking at doing a, a more a super, you you would maybe take out a frame of honey or something like that, give them a frame of foundation to, for them for something for them to do. You could, but just so long as you were quick. Yeah. So, you know, today if you open the box, side frames. Yeah, yeah. If today you opened the box and saw that you know seven frames were full, but yes, there was good honey, then yeah, pinch a pinch one frame, close it up real quick. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. then you haven't really technically disturbed the cluster. So I was about to say, yeah. make that yeah. reiterate that point you said earlier yeah. about yeah. any action right now yes. has got to avoid breaking that cluster. It's yeah. Not, it's, yeah, that's too early, and people people have got to leave their frames in position for a while yet. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, and the outside frames are technically insulation for the hive as well. So, but it's still not pulling that mind, but yeah. If they're, yeah, if it looks like they're gonna maybe swarm because they have actually been a couple of swarms out. Um, yeah, just this last week, we've um seen the first few reports. Which, um, talking to Ben Moore on the phone the other day from Ben's Bees to him that the one he picked up on Tuesday, I think it was, is the yeah. earliest swarm he's ever collected. It was a small swarm. It was a tiny one. Yeah. Really That's, unusual. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's just amazing that, um, yeah, it's come through so early. And I saw a few people post on the um, chat earlier in the session about how springs come so early for some people this year. And, um, and obviously, we're like we're, most of us are probably Australian, but I know there's a people, um, Axel, hello, from other countries listening in. But um, that whole idea of like that we've all got different climates and different experiences, and that's why we'll make sure our guests over time come from some different parts of this fine country. But um, certainly down here, if you're in Melbourne, to be having a swarm now is just a real surprise. Maybe another week or two, but I think that's uh, going to catch some people on the hop this year. But so, Sorry, Prashant, I know you've got another question, but just while we're talking about swarms and while we're talking about are you ready for spring, you need to be thinking, okay, if I do have a swarm, if my hive does swarm, what am I going to do? Because you, you have to go and catch them um, and because they're your bees and, you know, you don't want to be a pest for somebody else. So you have to go and catch them. So do you have a box ready to rock and roll? Do you have foundation ready to rock and roll? Or unless you're, you know, doing natural beekeeping with no foundation, but you still need your strips ready to roll. You still need all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to catch swarms, have you got your swarm boxes ready to rock and roll? Um, and are they marked? Do they have your phone numbers on and all that kind of jazz? Because um, there are requirements for swarm boxes, by the way, guys. You can't just go and take a no. box and leave it somewhere. It actually has to have your details on it so that if somebody sees it, they can actually contact you. Oh, is it? So Michelle is asking with under supering, is it temporary way of supering until the weather is consistently warmer? Well, yes, but as I said, you would question the need to under super. You would only know that by lifting the lid and seeing seven full frames of bees. You'll, you'll see lots and lots of bees. That's when I would be tempted to under super. But if you lifted that box, the lid, and you can only see, you know, two, three, four frames of bees, then just put the lid back on and leave them be. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Dion is asking, so if you you found a hive with a black mold goo on the walls, is it okay to break the brood and change boxes or leave it as it is, considering the weather? So if, there's, if there's mold or something is developing the hive at this time of year, what are you doing is the question. Yes. Oh, mold. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got ventilation problems. But yeah, once again, if, if it's in there, they're living with it at the moment, let them live with it for a couple more weeks and then, yeah, pull, pull the frames out and... and possibly throw that whole box away and, and pop a new one on um, well i know simon from your studies is that um the hives like to have about a 95 percent humidity um which is a lot higher than what i actually thought it was ever going to be um but yeah so it is a bit of a problem but you know you want to be looking at things like increasing your entrance to actually increase ventilation mm -hmm. so if you've got you know you know uh, entrance reducers on take them off um if you if you can't do that maybe you want to look at changing your base so you can actually have a screen bottom board or something like that you could be in a very wet moist environment where like in the dandelion ranges or something like that a screen bottom board at this time of year could be quite advantageous to dealing with you know moisture content um how many vents you've have you got in um i know for me i've got i've got lids with, which you've got two vents um on on each end 
but I was running with a um, uh, inner cover as well. So the inner cover was actually stopping the ventilation. Take the inner covers out, and now I've got more ventilation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, unless that black goo is actually a slime out from the small hive beetle. Oh, hell. Yeah, that's true. Which yeah. I wouldn't expect. I wouldn't anticipate for this time of year for the numbers of small hive beetle, unless it's for, it's an old slime out from last season, mm. which I think you might have noticed. Um, I've certainly experienced um, frames to the outside of a box, or if I if I am, and Paul keeps asking, and, and I'm glad you are, Paul, about whether we're all running uh, double brood chambers or singles, and I'm going to answer for, for probably all of us. We've probably got a mix of all. <laughs> it's probably not one consistent way that that's done. Um, is that fair to put that to you, Michael and Ryan, that there there's, might be a mix of the two? Yeah, I, I'm, I've got 300 hives. They're all double. They're all double brood box. Every okay, single one good of them. to know. Yeah. And I know, Ryan, yeah. you've got yeah. a bit of a mix. Is that yeah. the case still? I, well, I do have a, I do have a mix, but that's just because I'm trying to get them all to at least doubles. Um, but Michael also um, he's got a wonderful way of overwintering, in that he leaves a ton of honey on, um, mm. and for the you know and for the main reason of kind of going. First of all, it's insulation. It's really good for the bees and make sure that they're, they're overwintered well. But whatever's left over, when it comes to spring, I've got to harvest straight away. Um, and, and also the, the other idea behind it is, yes, I've got to harvest straight away, but guess what happens to humans in spring? Hay fever. So I've now got a product that's jam-packed full of what they're allergic to. I've just harvested it. Here, start chowing down yeah, on this yeah, every yeah. day. It's it, great it, for sales. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Was, what I was going to mention before about the double brood box is sometimes that can mean it's more common from the little bit of experience I've had that the outside extremities of the double brood box may have nothing in them except just some empty honeycomb. And yep. when they're trying to manage that entire environment, they're not going to worry about the extremities as much. They're going to worry about the cluster. And it's not uncommon to see um, a little bit of that powdery mould um, or mm. powdered mould that's starting to fill in some of those frames. And at this time of year, my thinking is in a couple of weeks from now, the bees will have tidied that up. Yes, 100%. It's they'll clean right it up. Now. Yeah. It's there right now. And I've certainly looked at some frames going, oh, and this is when I was early, in earlier days going, oh, I ruined it. But in two, if I just left them in there two weeks later, mm. the bees would have sorted that out and there'd be pollen and honey or nectar being brought in. Yep. So, Sean, what else you got for us, mate? So Paul has another question. When would you take an entrance reducer at this time of the year? Why? Why would we take it off? Well, I'd take it off so that I increased um, increased uh, airflow is why I would, um, because it is it's cold. You're getting a lot of humidity. They're bringing in nectar right now, oh, and totally. overnight they've got to fan it and they've got to get rid of the moisture out of that. So that, that's like there's a lot of moisture that's actually happening at the moment um uh, and they're breathing a lot they're breeding so there's more bees so they're they're, they're condensing a lot more so you you kind of really need to get that moisture out the entrance reducers for me are a way of trying to stop wasps from getting in and stop other bees from robbing um so at this time of year not really an issue although we've just said that we've just seen a wasp um i wouldn't say that they're predominantly an issue it's at the end of summer for me yeah, I'd remove it tomorrow, Paul. Yeah, I did mine today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. There so you go. Uh, one last question from Axel. I have caught four wild swarms from a building, the same building I have been feeding one-to-one -one syrup. Should I continue to feed like this or should I now start to go heavy? Now, Axel, I think I noticed you're from, you're not, a, you're not based UK. in Australia. Yeah, so in the UK, um, I'm going to assume there, and you can perhaps type that your seasons are obviously reversed to us. So for you at the moment, it's a little bit late. It's uh, coming into the end of summer into autumn. Getting ready um, to over winter. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I'd say if you're going to feed, um, the one-to-one -one is more, the, the one-to-one has got more water in it, right? And so they've got to, they've got to work harder in order to, in order to get uh, rid of that moisture content. So it's kind of like, a, I would say a one-to-one -one is more of like a, an earlier season feed. And then when you're actually trying to get them to store it for over, for over winter, um, the two-to-one feed is more like a nectar. Um, mm. So they're more likely to store it as yep. such. 
Um, and I definitely, I'd be going a two to one fee trying to get into it. Yes, makes sense. Um, Prashant, while you just maybe just check those chat notes for us um, and just let us know in a moment if there's anything more, I just want to share my screen really briefly while uh, we just collate the last opportunity there. And I just wanted to show the people that were uh, having a bit of a look at this tonight, just very briefly, a little bit about where they can go and find a little bit more assistance if they're looking for it. So the Hype Buddy website um, has been fairly recently put up there. And on here, you can find information about the programs and the mentors that are involved with what we do. We know deeply, and Michael, you're one of our new mentors on this particular program. We know that uh, many people struggle in that first year in finding that right sort of advice. And whilst we want them to read the book, we want them to go on the hands-on practical course and all those elements, we're looking at being able to support and assist people. Oh, there you are, mate. Look at you. There I am. Go. Where they're, yeah. where they're looking at supporting people in an ongoing mentoring format. So I just wanted to quickly show people that whilst uh, we're just having a moment to collate the last few bits and pieces. Um, and that's just gone online in the last day. So those that are interested can, in getting that little bit of extra support um, should go and take a look when they get a spare moment. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. Um, anything else that's um, appeared in there, Prashant? Because I just wanted to make sure, I know that the list has got quite long, that's why I thought I'd give you a quick moment to take a look and see, what the, see what's going on, but maybe maybe we're sorted by the same. Uh, that's set for the questions, but people are loving it, yep. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll take, we'll take that endorsement. Damn. Yeah. We'll take that endorsement and go with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, before before we head off, right? We're, we're gonna we're gonna quiz we're gonna quiz Michael a little bit, yes. right? Um, cool. Because we want to find out a bit more about you, about what you do, uh, what you've got, and why you do it. So, first of all, tell us tell us about you know about your shop. Where are you? What are you doing? So yeah, we have a um, obviously the main part of our business is is beekeeping and honey sales. We're in Rushdale Street in Knoxfield. We were a home-based business. We just got way too big for home. So we moved into a factory. The factory luckily had lots and lots of offices. We pulled down some walls and made a shop. Now, when we finished building the honey shop, we had a great space left over. So let's make it the time. I call it the time poor, the man, time poor man's beekeeping shop. Everything's made for you. You just kind of come and pick it up, walk away and, and have your life. And, but you know here's everything so if you if you're already late for spring come to my shop because i got everything it's all done for you so yeah i'm coming, I'm we, coming. Uh, yeah <laughs> so yeah we have the shop and then in in the shop as i said we try to make use of every bit of honey every bit of wax every bit of everything so um i'm a bit of a crazy dreamer and i dream lots and lots of things and man have i come up with some some things that we do with honey. So, you know, we've got a, a one, of the, one of the questions I asked Michael with like when before all this was like, um, what do what do you what do you love about beekeeping? Or, you know, is it the bees? Is it, you know, the yep. uh, and you know, um is it the travel? Is it um, the mentoring, all this kind of stuff? And um and and he said, you know, uh, uh, amongst the people, that was one of his first things, it was like, I no, 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 I know, I know. One of the things that Michael absolutely loves doing is coming up with new products. <laughs> yeah. He is constantly, constantly oh. coming up with new products. So come on, tell us about what you've got going. So the latest one that we've just bet we I'm just waiting for my liquor license so that I can technically sell it, but it was an orange blossom honey gin. So we've been working on that for six months with a gin uh, distillery and we've come down with a bloody, I'm telling you, I've had some very nice sampling along the way. <laughs> and that's 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 all labelled. That's all labelled and ready to go. What one thing that we're doing at the moment is, as everybody knows, it, the the climate and the particularly in Australia with bushfires and all that sort of stuff. So we're trying to work hand in hand with other beekeepers, small beekeepers that really can't get their product to market. So we're working with them now, and we're going to be their market for them. So today we released what's called the Taste of Victoria box, and it's eight different honeys featured in, from around Victoria. We're working with the Wing Bee Foundation. I'm not sure if people know of the Wing Bee Foundation, but it's a, it's a charity that's completely set up wholly and solely to save bees, basically. So we're working with them. So each box will have a, a packet of seeds in it from the Wing Bee Foundation. They get $5 from every box that we sell. And then a little bit later on, we've been once again collecting honey from all over Australia. 
that has been an absolute joy tasting some of the different varieties of honey that that our country produces and we're ready to rock and roll we're just waiting for some jars to come from overseas to to be able to launch that product so that's still probably a month away but yeah so we'll we will have a a, a jar of honey from every state i was telling ryan you know i've forever got ideas in my in my head he's, my he's an all, engineer my, that's what he is yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> tell. my friend my friends all call me the rain man <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 working on this australian honey and i'm thinking how am i going to present this anyway i went to bed and in the morning i woke up and thought Oh man, I dreamt I dreamt what I needed to do. I straight away grabbed the pen and paper and drew this this shelf up that I've now had laser cut and everything. So it's a map of Australia. Uh, it's in a big now big iron um, holder that's now got a shelf for every in every state. And when when we get those honeys, there'll be a, a honey from every state on display. And yeah, you wait for some of the like Tasmania, for instance. We've got some fennel honey from Tasmania that. It's oh, from really? a fennel farm, and it's just bloody awesome. <laughs> Northern Territory, I've got a, a, a paper bark cross bloodwood honey, and I've got to say, it's oh my Lord. One of, it is one of the best honeys I've ever, ever tasted. It is seriously beautiful. Oh. Um, and, you know, um, <laughs> um, a macadamia honey, like oh, bees okay. pollinate macadamias, they bring back yeah. a lot of nectar. The macadamia honey is just to die for. So, you know, we, we'll be bringing out the taste of Australian range shortly. And as I said, it's, it's supporting other beekeepers because we're all in the same industry. Let's help each other. The, you know, there was a bit of a, Simon will agree, there's a bit of a discussion the other day about commercial and backyarders. Well, we, we can work together. Oh, to, and it's the same. Commercial, some commercial guys won't work with backyarders and, and back, some backyarders won't work with commercials. We'll let them fight it out the sides and let everybody else work together. That's what, <laughs> this, that's what this is about. Yeah. And the that's truth what is, this is about. There's yeah. so much opportunity for everybody. We're not about yeah. to run dry of being able to go out there and provide services and, and get together and do good things. That's how I sort of see that. Yeah. And do you know what you're about yeah. to add to your, like, um, like as Ryan said, you're about to go and add to your innovation and like future is bigger booty Spartan giant beehives. It's a, tro <laughs> anyone, it's a Trojan horse. Trojan, Trojan anyone horse that wasn't beehives. listening to the first 15 minutes of this and came in a bit late will go, bigger booty, Trojan, Spartan, what? Anyway, you have to go back and watch the recording for that because yes. that got a, bit, got a bit weird there early on. <laughs> All right. Now, before we wrap up, Michael, we've got two questions for you. We're going to ask the same questions to every guest, okay? Yep. Tell me, what is the biggest mistake that you've ever done beekeeping or in the bee industry? Um, buying the bunya beekeeper. <laughs> Oh, well, don't laugh. Big, big bold comment. Yeah. And, well, I only, I only say that because, unfortunately, when companies go into liquidation, there's a lot of people hurt along the way. Sure. There yeah. is a hell of a lot of people hurt along the way. Now, when you buy it. You I, I got, a guy like me that. comes along and buys. Well, I've got to then wear the hurt. And so I, I say, no, I say that was one of the worst things I've ever done, but it's also the best thing I've ever done. So once I got over, people got over the initial 18 months of hurt, it's turned into a bloody damn good business. And I, and I meet a lot of fantastic people. I love people walking in the door and just talking, not even bees, just talking crap. Like, it's just, I, I <laughs> love it. It comes your way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. And the second question is, is what would be one piece of advice for new beekeepers? Oh, stay off the internet. Well, sorry, no, oh. this is on the internet. Stay off Facebook. <laughs> Facebook Facebook is just, yeah, I don't even, I, I hardly even go on it myself. Please, please stay off it. it it's full of crap. It really is. The um, one it piece becomes of, so important to find your people, doesn't it? Like you've got to yeah, find your people. Yeah. You don't have to think the same way as everyone else. You don't have to go mainstream, but you need yes. to be able to think for yourself and find people that like fit in with you. That's how I Yes, it. yes. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That, I agree, yeah. Join a bee club, get involved in the bee club and find the people in the bee club that you feel comfortable with. If it's only two of them, then hook up with two of them. If it's 10 of them, same thing. They might, And it's the same with every club. There's going to be somebody walking to go, whoa, you're a wanker, I don't want to know you. Well, don't know him. Find <laughs> the ones works. you want you like. Yeah. <laughs> like it's simple, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think we'll um we'll take it that we're all not wankers because we're all hanging out together. So that's good. exactly yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Axel's got a good question for you, Michael, and he yep. wants to know: Do you do uh, online delivery to the UK? We certainly can. The problem is, though, I, I can Axel, but sometimes it costs more to ship a jar of honey than the jar of honey. Oh, but yes, yeah. we we hundred percent can send it if you're happy to pay the freight costs. There you go. 
Yes. And not, nice comment, Andrew. I'm not going to read that one out loud. <laughs> Hilarious, mate. Look, we should probably uh, move ourselves along a little bit from here. Um, what a fantastic conversation we've had. We've gone in all sorts of different directions um, and it's been truly uh, fascinating and we're grateful to have you, Michael, and your different thoughts. No, thank you for inviting me. And Ryan, uh, our next session. Yeah. Well, we haven't booked it in. I, it, we were meant to do this session last week, but then I realised it was actually on my wife's birthday. Oh, you're so going to admit that to the public. public. Oh, you're admitting it. You're admitting admitting everyone that to the know. Public. I was going to let that go. <laughs> yeah. So here we are a week later, right? <laughs> um, I don't know, probably another two weeks, uh, probably probably about another two weeks, I think, yeah. The, the truth is, is we don't know exactly how often. We also know that as shift workers and lot, we're working in with lots of different people, we're going to have to be a little bit ad hoc with how we do this. We will always make sure that we record them so people can go back and listen to them or if they couldn't be there in the first place, they've got that opportunity to do so. Um, we'll make sure that that can happen. Um, but there's a, the one way you can find out is just keep an eye on um, the Hive Buddy platform and uh, we'll push it out through socials as well. Sorry, Michael, we still just still use them just a little bit to communicate with the good people. That's right, so do I. <laughs> so keep an eye out there and we'll try not to shift and change it a whole lot. Um, Prashant, any last questions or the like from your end? So not the questions, but uh, since this week this is being recorded, I just got a message from Gail saying that she couldn't hear it. So when when we post the recording, it's just that she's included in this. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll make sure that um, it gets out there to to, to anyone yeah. and everyone who's interested. Awesome, thanks, mate. And Ryan, any parting final comments or anything you want to throw out there before we finish up? Uh, no, good luck with the bees over the next couple of weeks. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Michael, for joining us. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Um, and thank you, Prashant. Thank you, Simon. And adios. can I just, can I just give there? everybody one little one little bit of homework to do tomorrow morning? Ooh. Go out and lift the back of your hives, and that's going to tell you how much time you've got. Just lift it. If you can lift it with one hand, you're 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 laughing. If you can't lift it with one hand, start planning urgently. Yes. One bit of advice. And Ryan, <laughs> I'm going to finish off on um, sharing that awesome intro video with you one more time. So that it doesn't matter what we've said, everyone's going to leave on a, on a mighty fine bit of laughter. So stand by as I share a screen and show you that, and then we'll uh, sign off there. Thanks, everyone, for being here. It's been absolutely awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good idea. Hilarious. I love it. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye, guys. Good night. <laughs>